Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast, where we give coaches and consultants practical ideas for taking you to the next level in your business and in your life. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. I interview experts who've walked in your shoes and offer real world experience that you can apply to your own journey. Welcome to another episode of the Strong for Performance podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I am more than excited today to have as my guest, Michael Gelb. Michael, welcome to my show for the second time. Great to be with you. Thank you. Well, it is so wonderful to have time with Michael Gelb. If any of you have read any of Michael's books or heard him speak, you know why I'm so Uh, pumped about having him with me today. Michael is a professional public speaker and he's a prolific author. He's written, I think it's 17 books now, right, Michael? Yes. Including the international bestseller, How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. He was my guest in an earlier episode, number 53, where we talked about one of his other excellent books, The Healing Organization, and I encourage you to listen to that if you haven't uh, seen it or heard it already. Michael is known for his life-changing presentations on topics such as creative leadership, genius thinking, and conscious business. And in his new book called Mastering the Art of Public Speaking, Eight Secrets to Transform Fear and Supercharge Your Career, he reveals many of the strategies that he's used over the past for decades to perfect his own craft. And I've read this book. I just loved it. Michael, you are such a, I would say gifted writer, but I know the years you've spent honing that craft as well. It's an excellent book. And we're going to delve into some of these eight secrets in our conversation today. Michael is just a wealth of of information on this whole arena. And whether you are a professional speaker yourself, or you simply need to get up in front of a group at times with your career, Michael's book is for you. Um, There are so many things that I learned and we're gonna tap into some of those great insights that Michael shares in his book. And I think after you've heard our conversation, you're going to wanna get a copy of this for yourself. So, Michael, let's jump in. The first thing I want to ask you about is something that I know many people deal, deal with when they hear the word public speaking, and that's the word fear. And um, what I would like you to talk about, because I, I like the way you address this in the book, how they can transform that fear. I liked that word transform. How can they get those butterflies to form? Uh, in or fly in formation so that they're effective yes well the first point is for people to realize that effectively we have nothing to fear but fear itself (laughs) in other words fear is quite common it's the number one Public speaking is the number one fear in survey after survey of people around the world. Death is seventh on the list. In the book of lists, public speaking number one, death number seven. That means the average person would rather be dead and buried than have to give the eulogy. But if we put it to you that way, you'll you'll give the eulogy. (laughs) But it really is a, a common fear and It's important to know that, accept that it's okay to feel anxious, to feel nervous, to feel the butterflies. And you're in good company because some of the finest performers, professional speakers, household name actors and actresses from all over the world have experienced and still experience these butterflies. The question as you posed it is how do you get them to fly in formation? But the first simple step is to understand that it's kind of normal, that you're not the only one who's ever felt this way. 
And that's the first step in transforming the fear. It also really helps if you understand that the people who are there in your audience, unless you are really a highly paid professional speaker or a politician or in a debate format, empathize with you being up there because it's their number one fear too. Mm -hmm. So in most situations, people don't really have wildly high expectations of what a presentation is going to be. So there's not that much to be afraid of in the sense that people understand and most folks tend to get so caught up with, oh my God, I'm nervous. Oh my God, my face is all red. Oh, my hands are shaking. Oh, this is gonna be such a disaster. When you're pretty much the only one who, who cares about whether your face is red or not. No one's really noticing that you're shaking. All the audience really cares about is, are you bringing us something of value? Do you ha have something to share, something to say that might help me, that might benefit me? And when you shift your attention from how you feel to why you're doing this, you will feel better. It's, it's just so simple. Focus on the audience. This is one of the first secrets for transforming the fear is notice it, accept it, and then focus on why you're doing this. What is the purpose of this presentation? And I help my clients. I've worked with people over 40 years, all kinds of people. People are absolutely terrified. People had to give for the first time, they had to give a really high profile presentation. I've helped people literally get ready for their first television appearance. I've helped people get ready to speak to Congress. Uh, I've helped people get ready for the most important sales presentation in their company's histories. I help people get ready to uh, speak uh, in times of crisis to their companies. This is even very recently. Uh, when, when people, my clients were dealing with the first days of the pandemic and layoffs in their companies and furloughs, I help clients prepare their address to their companies to help bring people together. So I've been through a lot of, a lot of situations and it's amazing what a difference it makes if you write down your objectives what you want to achieve with this audience in this presentation. And I guide people to do that in terms of three very simple things to do before every presentation. Write down, what do I want my audience to know? And be specific. So I want them to know, for example, later on, we might talk about the principles that help people remember What's in a presentation? That's also an important thing to know. There are five principles. I made up an acronym, which we'll talk about later. But let's say my talk was on those five principles. I might say, what I want them to know are these five principles. How do I want them to feel? Well, I want them to feel excited and confident about going out and giving this presentation. I want them to feel that they, they just can't wait to do it and that they're brimming with enthusiasm. What do I want them to do? I want them to go give a presentation in which the audience will remember these five points and will feel really good and will re-engage you as a, a speaker. <laughs> so whatever it is, tailor that to whatever your presentation is. Because here's the problem. Because of the fear, people's unconscious objective for their presentation is survive this without embarrassment. And when that's your objective, then you're, you're going to look tight, you're going to feel tense, you're going to be focused on yourself mm -hmm. and your own survival instead of what you want to be focused on, which is the results I get with the audience. That's, it's the only way we ultimately measure the success of all our communication is what did the audience receive? 
what, and this is, is equally true in one-to-one -one interpersonal communication. Actually, I read this fantastic book called Connect With Your Team. It talks <laughs> all about how it's all about the audience. This is just a universal principle, right? But it's also true, and especially true, when you have a bigger group of people. Mm -hmm. What do I want them to know? How do I want them to feel? And what do I want them to do as a result of my presentation? And for the, the what do I want them to know part, focus on the KISS principle. Keep it simple speaker. So one of the big pitfalls of presentation, and, and this is one that's the people who fall into this tend to be the most accomplished and brilliant people. So people with PhDs and MBAs and advanced degrees and JDs and so on and so forth. People who really have a lot of knowledge for their topic, they fall into what I call molecule fondling. Molecule fondling. Yes. Right. Yes. That that phrase jumped out at me at the book, and I thought, "What is this?" <laughs> and then, of course, it made perfect sense. So you have to explain that because that does have a, an interesting connotation. <laughs> well, it was it was it's, so it's a true story. I was um, I used to work for many years with the scientists, the chemical engineers at Dupont. Every Dupont engineer went through my three day seminar in creative thinking for about a seven or eight year period. I used to do them for everybody. And great group of people. And among the most successful chemical engineers were a group, were part of what DuPont called their fellows program. So these were the engineers who had generated the most patents for DuPont. And when you reach a certain number of, of patents, you got invited to the fellows program. And now the restrictions and regulations that dominated the regular workplace were lifted. You were given a bigger budget, the best laboratory, your time was your own, just get us more patents. And the head of the fellows program, it's a brilliant fellow, and he applied a lot of the methodologies that I was teaching him. He was a great mind mapper and learned the principles of creative thinking that I teach and applied them. But he came to me and he said, look, we're having trouble communicating with the marketing people. We're giving these presentations and we don't seem to be connecting with them. He said, can you help us improve our presentations to the marketing team? So I came in and I said, okay, let's get, I'll be the marketing team, you give me the presentation, we'll put them on video. So one engineer got up after the other and they went on and on about the molecules that they were working on. Well, the molecule did this, and then we tried this reagent, and the molecule did that. And so if I'm a marketing person at DuPont, I don't care about the molecules. I care about what does this do? Is it safe? When will it be ready? And what cool name are we going to give it in order to market it? Remember, these are the people who gave us Teflon and Corian. So... When I got the scientists thinking about the perspective of the marketers, the, the head scientist stood up and he said, oh my God, we are guilty of molecule fondling. <laughs> <laughs> so I find molecule fondling, it's the tendency to focus on your subject and forget that your purpose is to focus on your audience and communicate your subject in terms of things that you want your audience to know, that you want your audience to feel, that you want your audience to do. I mean, Meredith, have you ever been in a presentation where people use jargon that the audience doesn't understand? Oh, yes. Right, where they use acronyms that the yes. audience doesn't understand? So yep. they feel good because they're talking about something that they have an insider's sense of. They're using the code language, and that's fine. If, if I'm a chemical engineer and I'm talking to other chemical engineers and we've all been initiated into the molecular language, 
knock yourself out. Use all the acronyms you want, all the jargon you want. But if it's a broader audience, if they haven't all been initiated, you have to explain what the jargon means. And what's a wonderful thing to do is initiate people into your jargon initiate them into your acronym because then they feel included they are now part of something that previously was exclusive and now they're an insider so the simple point here is it's not about you it's about your audience <laughs> right and i love that and i that example is such a good one because too often we don't realize that we're in a mismatch with that audience. And I think that what you've just described to me is a perfect way of overcoming your own fear. When you're putting yourself in the position of the person receiving your message and the three questions you ask, and I like the way you repeated them, <laughs> the no feel and do. You know, I think that helps lead into another area. You had mentioned there were two, um, I forget the word you use, predicates that, um, you know, are kind of like the two elements that if you get this, it's really simple. And it reminded, when you were talking about that, it reminded me, just describe those two elements because I think that can help people feel more comfortable that there's not some grand list of things they're going to have to memorize and do to be an effective speaker. Be clear, be present. Be clear, be present. Can't get much more simple than that, but go ahead and just talk about those for a minute. What do you, what do you mean by those? Be clear about what your message is. Why are you there? What's the purpose of the presentation? What are the benefits for the audience? What do you want them to know, feel, and do? Be present, in other words, in the moment, instead of worrying about whether you're nervous or whether your face is red or your hands are shaking or whatever, look out at your audience. You can do this even on Zoom, because a lot of us are you know, doing lots of pre presenting in virtual Realms, all of this is even more important in a virtual realm. All of, the, all of the principles in the book become even more important when you are on a Zoom or a webinar jam or some other online platform. So tune into the audience and focus on their body language. I, I taught a seminar the other day. It was really a challenging presentation because I had some people live in the room and then I had about 30 or more people on the Zoom. Mm. So I'm, and oh, and I had to wear a mask while I was presenting because it was at a university. I was teaching a, a, an executive MBA program. And so what I was doing, however, is instead of worrying about wearing this mask and what was going on with me, I was tuned in to the body language and the, the facial expressions of the people in the room. And I could see all of the people on this. I had the Zoom set up so I could see all of these little people and I'm tuning into each one of them. And I could, you know, what's really fun, I'm, I have to say that I, I do think that the, the most challenging form of presentation is stand-up comedy. And if I, can, if I can get people to laugh on Zoom in the middle of a pandemic while I'm wearing a mask, then to me that's, a, that's another thing that I love about presenting. And I had people in the Zoom room, I could see them chuckling. But my, my point is, Focus on the audience, focus on the audience. When I say be present, if, if, if we're together, if we're having a conversation, and let's say we're together having coffee, and I'm going like this, or I'm checking my phone, 
and you're my friend, you'd say to me, hey, I'm over here. Because the point of being with somebody is to be present with them. So that's the same with one person you're having coffee with as a thousand people that you're giving a keynote presentation to. Be present in the moment. How are they doing? How, read the audience. Focus on what you want them to know, feel, and do. This is seeming pretty simple and easy, isn't it? Well, it really does, because if you think about it, you know, this fact that we can't really focus our attention on more than one thing at a time. So if we're really focused on the audience and reading them and, and delivering value and being of service to them, we can't also be in our heads worrying about how am I coming across? How do I look? How do I sound? And all of that. So I, I just like that very simple two-step. Be clear, be present. Clear. How much simpler can you get? Be present. And I just want to bring it back to that when you set your objectives, it's why I tell you to write them down. What do you want them to know? What do you want them to feel? What do you want them to do? It stops you from going off on a tangent. If somebody asks you a question, and you see this with speakers all the time, they go off into a whole other world because they were, that was an interesting question, and blah. blah. No, I'm here for, because I want to, I, I'm going to make sure at the end of whatever this time is, everyone here knows what I want them to know. I want them all to feel the way I want them to feel, and I want them to do what I want them to do. If it's a sales presentation, I want you to buy whatever it is and X amount of it for so, such and such a price. Or maybe I want you to sign a petition or join or subscribe to something. Or maybe I want you to stop doing something. I need to know, why, why are we doing this presentation? What do I want you to do differently as a result of whatever it is I'm doing? And what that does, it naturally gets you to think. What do I want them to know? Yeah, it's a really important question. As soon as you're invited, see, average person say, okay, uh, uh, we need you to give this uh, presentation. It's really important. It'll be all the senior people in our organization. Uh, it'll be next Tuesday. Uh, you'll have, uh, we want you to speak for 75 minutes on, on the project you've been working on. Give us a, a report and, and let us know the status. The first reaction most people have is, yikes. <laughs> is, uh-oh. <laughs> and they start to go into fear mode. Their physiology goes into fear mode. And they're just thinking about, oh, my God, what could go wrong? And that's not how you set yourself up for success in any endeavor. Now, it's okay to feel that. But now, even those just people without even reading the book, just from listening to our conversation, people say, oh, how fascinating. Notice that the butterflies start to go flittering. What do I do? Well, who's going to be in the audience? Let's get curious. Who's going to be in the audience? What do I want them to know? Let me start writing down. What, what do I want them to know? How would I want them to feel at the end of this? And what do I want them to do? Whoosh, the butterflies are starting to line up. And your energy starts to focus and become clear. And your, that's, is fear starts to transform into enthusiasm. Another little coaching point that can be very, very helpful for people is the same physiology that can be interpreted as fear as anxiety can also be interpreted as, as excitement. So you just say, wow, how exciting. I'm so excited. Feel all this energy that has arisen at the very thought of doing this. I, I'm going to utilize this energy to make sure they know what I want them to know, feel what I want them to feel, and do what I want them to do. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Let's talk next then, this leads into something you referenced earlier, which is the mind mapping. Because now that they know what they want people to know, what's the best way for them to organize this presentation? And I have to say, um, I, I really found that chapter on mind mapping valuable because I tend to be an outline kind of gal, you know? And so this, uh, this was a different way, even though I'm familiar with map, my, map, mind mapping, I've tried it. I haven't been as successful with it, but there were things you brought out that I think 
really helped me rethink that whole approach. So first, define what mind mapping is for those that don't know and why you recommend that over outlining for getting your, your presentation organized. Sure. Well, mind mapping is a simple, easy way to map your ideas. It allows you to generate more ideas in less time and make connections between those ideas. It engages more of your brain because it invites you to use imagery and color as well as keywords. So finding keywords is something that actually makes you think in a more specific, focused, detailed, analytical way, but finding images and colors wakes up the imaginative, playful part of your mind. So it is the methodology for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci, for integrating art and science, logic and imagination. There's another aspect of mind mapping that is particularly helpful in preparing for presentation. And it's one of the big secrets of the creative process in any walk of life, but especially when you're preparing your ideas to present. And it's to find the harmony between generation and organization. Now, outlines are wonderful ways of organizing your ideas. But if you try to generate your ideas in organization, uh, in, in an outline, you will suffer from what I call premature organization. Because if you try to put things in order before you generate them, that's illogical. Why would you do that? Generate them first, then organize them. So because mind mapping, instead of a top-down hierarchical linear format like outlining, mind mapping says, no, start in the center of a page, draw a creative doodle that represents your topic, and then go off in any direction with your associations. But express those associations using keywords and imagery so that you use more of your brain. Start by generating as much as you can. Don't worry about organizing at all. Then step back and look at it and ask yourself, okay, what's most important? And what order should I put it in? And then you'll find it organizes itself. Plus, when you make a mind map of your presentation, you just have images, keywords. You can get all of your notes for an hour long presentation on one really small piece of paper or on one screen of your device. So it makes it easier for you to remember what you're going to present. Plus, people who've been around in organizations for a while will find that they, they're at a conference or they're on a panel and they're prepared their remarks. And then the person before you says three quarters of what you are going to say. Or they bring up objections to what you are about to say that you hadn't yet considered. You need to think on your feet. If you're stuck with your PowerPoint or your file cards or even your outline, you don't have the flexibility to adapt on the fly, as they say in hockey. But mind mappers relish these circumstances because we just generate. We just say, okay, that's fascinating. What are my first thoughts about that? You put down the keywords, then you look at it, you say, okay, yeah, I'll talk about it in this order. And you make your mind map and all of a sudden, your skill as an extemporaneous speaker goes way up. And that is a really important senior executive leadership skill. And I'm telling you, know, as you mentioned, I've been doing this for decades. Over the years, I would say that of all of the specific practical things that I have taught my students, in presentation skills, public speaking workshops, the thing that they utilize the most and thank me for the most when I see them 10, 20, or 30 years later is the application of mind mapping to the preparation and recall of their own presentation. And what are the specific things that they mention are most, why is that the most valuable thing? Because it, because it gives them that, that feeling they didn't have before of being able to be extemporaneous, mm -hmm. being able to, so now you're, now you're really not afraid because you know you can craft your message in three minutes. You can be on the panel 
I, you know, I was on the panel of the Global Drucker Forum last year uh, in front of this huge audience, very prestigious. Everybody's a Harvard professor, whatever, on this panel. And people are asking questions and somebody's commenting. And I just, you know, made my quick little mind map and I got good reviews. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> they invited me back. That's like <laughs> well, you know, one of the uh, important things I want to emphasize here for people is what Michael is getting at here is not just uh, techniques for when you're in front of the group. You know, this, this preparation that you do in advance of that makes you more effective once you are in front of the group. And there are so many other things that we won't have time to get into today, uh, somewhat around uh, your, your, just your posture, how you stand, how you approach things. I, I, there's so much we could go into, but given our time, I, there's one thing I definitely want to cover with you. And that was the, um, the chapter about structuring your message so that it's memorable for your audience because that's the other, to me, kind of side of the coin. You can present this with using a mind map to be effective, but what are the things that a person could do who's going to give a presentation to really help that message stick with the audience? Yes, yes, because we said that the, you measure your success by the results you get with your audience. Too often people just think that means, well, if the audience understands my message, then I've been successful. No, they have to remember it as well. How do you make your message memorable? And I love your enthusiasm to, to get through these things, but you, what you realize is, I'm not kidding when I say these eight secrets, that, and they are graduated, full program of, everything I've learned in 40 plus years of being a professional speaker and coaching professional speakers and non-professional speakers to be more like professional speakers. So each skill builds on the next skill. So you make, now you know what you want them to know, feel, and do. You make your mind map of your presentation. So now you're gonna remember your own message, plus it's really creative and it's really well organized. So it's much easier for you to be clear and present. Now you're thinking, how do I make sure they remember it? So there are five principles that organize recall during the course of any time period. And we're going to let them know that acronym, right? We're going to give them the, the secret code. <laughs> yes, we are. We're going, to, we're going to initiate people into our acronym. But first I'll explain how I made up the acronym because I was many, many years ago co-presenting with the creator of mind mapping to whom this book is dedicated. And we spent years traveling the world doing these senior executive seminars together. This was in the late seventies and early 1980s. And we went to Australia, to Japan, all over Europe, all over the US doing these five day seminars. So we would be up there in front of the group with them for eight hours a day and having dinner with them. And either Tony was presenting or I was presenting. And at the end of each day and an extra long session at the end of the week, we would give each other critique. So that's part of how I learned all this was he was a really good, incisive critic. And what I found was my opportunity to critique him, and he was one of the greatest speakers in the world back then, but he was relying on me to help him get better. So I can't say whether I learned more from what he told me or from what I told him, because we tuned into what, what makes this work. And one of the things that Tony taught was memory and how to improve your memory. And he introduced these five principles that organize recall during time. And the way he would introduce us to a class is actually, I put it in the book. Uh, take 
a memory quiz. If, if we give you, we won't, we won't actually do it now because it takes too long, but if I give you a list of 108 words, just as a fun random number, and I just read them off to you and you can't write them down, just listen. Which words are you most likely to remember of those 108? Will you remember the first few words? Most people do. Will you remember the last few words? Most people do. Will you forget most of the words in the middle? Most people will forget them. But what if we repeat one of those words five times? What if one of those words is really outstanding, like a, someone's name of a famous person, for example? And what if we mention your name as one of the words? You think you might remember that? Sure, because it has a special personal association to you. So we remember that which comes first, first impressions. Everybody knows about this notion. We obviously remember things that are repeated. We remember things that are outstanding. Anything that's specially personally associated, we remember it. And we remember the last thing that we hear. So we call this, psychologists call this first principle the primacy effect. Repetition, outstandingness, personal association, and recency. So get ready for the initiation into the acronym for remembering the principles of remembering. PROPAR, primacy, repetition, outstandingness, personal association, and recency. So how do you apply PROPAR? You ask yourself, well, gee, I know I know what I want them to know. I know how I want them to feel, and I know what I want them to do. So I'm going to share that with them right at the beginning. Then I'm going to repeat my key message. I'm going to tell stories so that it's unforgettable. I'm going to relate those stories to my audience so it's personally associated. And what am I going to do at the end? Let them have it one more time. So it just becomes unforgettable. That's the ProPAR approach. And it's so simple and practical. Can you, uh, one of the things I wanted to be sure to ask you to do was share a story or two, either of your own experience or one of your clients, where because of, they, of applying this PROPAR, their impact was so much greater than it would have been otherwise. One of my favorite stories is in the book. I was working for years with the DuPont Pension Fund. I actually worked with them from 1985 until my client there retired in about 2004. Wow. And I did, I, I used to do creative thinking training, relationship building, uh, presentation skills training, and executive coaching for some of the key leaders. And one of the things that happened when I was working with them is they realized that instead of just being the DuPont pension fund and managing DuPont's retirement fund, they wanted to become an independent firm with DuPont as their main client, but also servicing other clients so that they could really be a, a business and this would be more lucrative for them. But they also felt that they could actually provide better service to DuPont and their other clients if they were an independent entity. So working with the director of this group, we formulated a strategy and part of that strategy involved getting the DuPont Pension and Benefits Committee to grant control of the savings plan for the company to our team. So that was one of the milestones needed to eventually spin off. And that was $8 billion. And at the time, most of that $8 billion was being managed by some external firms. But we wanted to get control of that $8 billion. But in order to do this, the team of analysts and portfolio managers had to get up and give a 
presentation to the DuPont Pension and Benefits Committee. Uh, and that included the chairman, the CFO, and it took place in the boardroom at the Mont Shannon building in DuPont on the top floor. It was like one of the old timey boardroom. It's like Dr. Evil's boardroom <laughs> from Austin Powers. So these people who I'm training were all analytical molecule, molecule fondling types. <laughs> They were all terrified of presenting, but they had no choice. <laughs> and they were really motivated by the opportunity to win and, and achieve this objective. So we, we tasked each person to come up with an authentic, natural, but really engaging way of getting their message across. And we had them come up with the idea because we wanted it to be their story. Because see, here's the thing, here's one of the secrets where introverts and shy, nervous people can all of a sudden become wonderful professional presenters, is figure out a story that's natural for you to tell. Do you know right. if you Great if, advice. Mm -hmm. Right. If you have if you have a movie that you love and you want your friends to go see it, you don't think, oh, I'm nervous about telling them about the movie. You just tell them about the movie and why you loved it, why they're gonna love it. And it's so so when people are speaking like that, butterflies in formation, it's compelling, it's engaging, and the message is outstanding. So I'll just give you one one example, because we had everybody do this, but one of the examples we had one of the analysts gets up to the front of the boardroom and, and part of our message, part of what we wanted them to know was we can do this at better, for better value than anybody else. And we also knew about our audience that they were value investors. So we wanted to show them that we understood the value investment approach more than the, our competition. So this gentleman's job was get them to understand in an unforgettable way that we appreciate and understand what's important to them because it's about them, not us. So he comes out and he, and he takes a handful of change and he throws it on the table and he says, how much money is on the table? And one of the senior executives says, $1.50, what's the point? Now these are tough, tough crowd, right? But we prepared him for this moment Exhale, pause. It's one of the secrets of a commanding presence is you're not in a hurry. You own the space, you take control of the situation, and you take your time. Not disrespectfully, not for too long, but you just, plus when you exhale, you shift your physiology out of the fear mode into the present connection mode. So we prepared him for the moment, he exhales, he says, may I suggest that you take a closer look? So they look through the change and one of them says, oh, there's a silver quarter here. That's unusual, you don't see too many of those. Our guy reaches into his pocket and pulls out a magnifying glass, magnifying eyepiece, and he hands it to the senior executive and he says, may I suggest you take an even closer look? So he looks with the eyepiece and he says, wow, this has a faulty mint mark on it. This is a very rare coin. Where did you get this? And the others now say, let me see that. And so they're passing it all around and they're all looking at it. He waits till they all see it. He collects all the change. He says, our savings plan is an undervalued asset. It's right here in our pocket. We've looked at it really closely, and we're gonna show you how we can get more value for you in the way we manage it. Now, yes, he delivered a very clear, well-organized, data-driven presentation after that that made his point. But chances are people are still talking about that presentation today because he just rocked their world in an unforgettable fashion that was exactly 
on message. It was what we wanted them to know. They couldn't forget it. And everybody did something in their own natural style. So we repeated the message. Every presentation was about value. We made everything outstanding and personally associated. We started strong. The, the boss of this group started with an overview, and then we finished, and we basically, in the appropriate way, asked for the sale. And we got control of the $8 billion, and that group became DuPont Capital Management, an independent, very successful entity, and my client was able to retire having completed the vision of his career. Such a profound, profound story and a profound example of what you're describing. Uh, because for one thing, and, and you give other, you know, uh, stories in the book, and I wish we had time to go into them all, but, but in each one, you painted such a clear picture with your words of what was going on, but also in your presentation or in the example you're sharing, it was visually, uh, you know, stunning and unforgettable. And I think that's the key thing, and it ties back into your what do you want them to know, feel, and then do, because it's all related. And I think, uh, and and in our own company, when we're drafting something where we want to get attention, and um, one of my business partners tends to be more, I'll say, left brain, you know, the analytical, dry, and I'll say, but where's the feeling? You know, we've got to touch their hearts. And, I, and that to me is what you're getting at there. The coin example uh, connects on almost a physical level with people. It's a way of getting that, you know, we use the word engagement, Michael, but what you're talking about is engagement plus. <laughs> you know? engagement plus. It's, it's so much more fun. It's involvement, yes. And the fun so aspect fun. is, to me, that's another aspect of getting those butterflies together, that you relax, your brain is not stressed and, and uptight because you're, it's enjoyable for you and for the audience. And, and you know, so through the course of my, my career, I've given many presentations where the audience was ordered to be there by the boss. Mm -hmm. I'd say most of my presentations have been mandatory. <laughs> I remember the email one, capital letters, mandatory. And I have people in construction management, people in uh, finance, people uh, in you know, scientists, pharmacists, biochemists, People who are real, I know, I know what their lives are like. They're insanely busy. And they don't think they need creative thinking training or communication training. So they really don't want to be there. And they, they're sitting like this. And they won't make eye contact with me because they, you know, eye contact is humanizing. And they don't want to acknowledge that they're even present. So the first thing I learned many, many years ago is don't take that poisonal because it's, it's not about me. I mean, if I was in their position, I'd feel the same way. If my boss made me come to somebody's presentation, who the heck is this guy? Why should I want to be here? So, but I empathize with them. And I'm, I've really thought about how I'm going to make this engaging and fun for them in a way that will really serve them. That's, if, it, you know, if it's not something that's really going to serve them, if, as my grandpa Jack used to say, if you're just out there selling a bill of goods, align that ability to sell a bill of goods with something helpful, with something useful. Your life will be more fulfilling and you'll be more successful. So I've never tried to sell anybody a bill of goods. I'm here to share with you whatever the topic is that I'm speaking about, it's something that I put a lot of time and effort into and I'm now really thinking about how is it going to be useful for you person in the audience. But, but there's no way you could know that yet just because of my bio or because I got somebody. To, so I it's my job. I've got to win you over. 
And the best way to do that is get people to laugh. You get them to laugh and their arms uncross. They, they can't help looking at you. And all of a sudden, body language, the whole room is changing. So I, stu I do study great comedians. I do watch a lot of great comedy because that's the, that's the ultimate thing. There, you know, you're walking into some nightclub, people are having a drink, they're trying to impress their date, uh, they're paying their own money, uh, and they're, they, they want to show off by heckling you. I have been, I have been heckled by uh, other speakers, but I, I take, you know, Jerry Seinfeld has this great notion about heckling. I put it in the book. Heckling is almost too good to be true because people are just, they're sending you a setup. It's like a straight line. And the secret of, of dealing with a heckler, a so-called difficult person, I always just, I just empathize with them. I completely disarm with them, uh, disarm them by, by being with them, by tuning into whatever is behind whatever they might be saying. And then slightly making fun of it. <laughs> Give an example of what you mean by that. Well, I need you to heckle me. <laughs> oh. Uh, so uh, so uh, I, was at a, I was at a presentation for the senior team of one of the uh, top toy companies in the world. And they were very, very stressed. It was supposed to be a retreat. And they had, there was actually another speaker who was some professor somewhere, and he was in the room. And much to my amazement, because usually speakers are pretty loyal to one another and uh, support each other. I certainly always try to support every other speaker. I always try to make every other speaker look good. But in the middle of my presentation, I was talking about Thomas Edison, and he just blurted out something about... Uh, Tesla. Uh, this this as I, I happened since quite a lot. People you know have this script somehow in their mind that Edison was a bad guy and Tesla was really a good guy, and that Edison oppressed Tesla and Tesla was the genius who was going to save the world, and Edison was the military industrial complex or something like that. So this guy, I was my, and I wrote this book called Innovate Like Edison with Edison's great 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 granny, so I'm talking about what a genius Edison was. And he said, he, he just says, uh, uh, well, Edison exploited Tesla and he was wrong. And he just lays all the stuff out in the middle of my talk. But I noticed the, the uh, uh, spelling, I previously noticed the spelling of the, this gentleman's last name. and it ended in I-C. I said to him, uh, uh, you wouldn't happen to be Serbian by any chance, would you? <laughs> he said, yes, how did you know? I said, because all of my Serbian friends are so passionate about Tesla <laughs> that they forget that the only reason we ever heard of Tesla is because Edison gave him a job. And yeah, they had a falling out. And you're right, Tesla was an incredible genius. And tonight at dinner, we'll have a, a, a conversation about how to innovate like Tesla. And now, you know, he was kind of on my side, a little bit embarrassed that he had gotten so. But I just empathize, you know, I get it. When, and I've since noticed this. Uh, when people can't contain themselves when I'm talking about Edison, a lot of times it's because they have a passionate love of Tesla. So now what I do, I don't wait for that to happen anymore. Now when I'm doing my Edison piece, I preempt it. I talk about Tesla up front. I say, how many people know about the, rival, the seeming rivalry between Tesla and Edison? And they go, yeah. And I say, well, did you know that it was actually a rivalry between Westinghouse and Edison and that it was Edison who brought Tesla to the U.S.? Gee, I didn't know that. And so, you know, so in other words, if you anticipate, you learn to anticipate objections, you learn to anticipate 
things and build them into your presentation because you're empathizing with the audience. That's so powerful. Um, because I think it goes back to the very first thing we talked about, Michael, where people get anxious and they're fearful. And when we're fearful, we tend to th take things personally. And so we feel attacked if somebody is questioning or looking less than enthusiastic about our presentation. So this, and I love the way you talk about empathy in the book. And I wish we could go there right now, but we're going to need to wrap up just because of time. I, I just can't say it strongly enough. Everybody that does any kind of presentation for their work, whether it's a sales presentation or speaking professionally, get this book because mastering the art of public speaking has so many tips in there, whether you're new to speaking or you're a seasoned professional, there are so, there's so much richness in there, Michael. So thank you for making this contribution to not just my listeners, but with your book to anyone who needs to become better at making presentations. So having said that, I would love for you to tell people how they can connect with you, how they can get, your book and what other exciting things do you have coming up that they might want to know about? Thank you so much. Well, best way is michaelgeld.com, G E L B, michaelgeld.com. And people can get the book there on the resources page. We also have coming really soon an online video seminar on how to think like Leonardo da Vinci. It's really cool. We have finally wrapped this baby it is three cameras brilliantly produced beautiful set lots of engaging exercises basically we've created the experience of being on my live three-day seminar now you can take it at home on your on your device or on your computer and the other thing that people might enjoy and benefit from is i started uh, teaching online live classes in developing the body mind presence that makes for great presentation so i do this through teaching the alexander technique which is the trade secret of many of the great theater and music schools of the world and through teaching qigong and tai chi principles which are just marvelous ways to feel good and stay young but also develop the kind of effortless commanding presence that allows you to feel at home in front of an audience of 10,000 people. And when people go to michaelgeld.com, the first image you will see on my homepage is me standing there in front of an audience of, I think it was 9,000 people, that audience, uh, looking very happy because we just experienced everything. I just, I apply, actually, it's just what I do, just what I do. And so I want you to be able to do it. It's that simple. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. You are a gift to the world and to me, and I appreciate you so much. And I know my audience is going to really enjoy this, and I hope the very next thing they do after listening to this is go get that book. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Strong for Performance podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com to learn how our tools can increase your impact with clients and expand your business. And while you're there, grab our free ebook, The Five Secrets to Getting Better at Anything. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell. Make it a great day.